We've been in an ongoing series about the gifts of Christmas. This is taken from the verse in Matthew chapter 2. Don't turn there. Matthew chapter 2, where the wise men, we know there were more than three, brought Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now most of us know what gold is. We catch on to that pretty quick. Frankincense, we struggle with that. But the last one really kind of throws us for a loop. Myrrh. Now I'll be honest with you, there's a few words in Scripture that I like. Just kind of catch your attention. Myrrh is one of those words. Don't you like to say myrrh? Just say it. Myrrh. Isn't that a neat word? Myrrh. Uh, it's kind of like murmuring. I, you know, I kind of like that word too. I don't know why. But it's a, it's a very interesting word. And it's a, as you research the history of this particular gift, it's very interesting uh, what we find out. We talked about gold representing uh, Christ as king. Last week, we look at frankincense, which implies that He is God. It suggests royalty as well. Myrrh suggests that He is our Savior. This substance, myrrh, was seen several times throughout Scripture. It's mentioned as a valuable perfume back in the Psalms and the book of Proverbs as well. In fact, if you look in Exodus, it's known as one of the anointing oils that was used with the priests were involved. Myrrh came from a, uh, a very thorny tree, which is an interesting concept when we think about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And it's usually found in the area of Middle East, Arabia, Ethiopia, in those areas. Myrrh was considered to be very valuable. Uh, it was something that was hard to come by, and if you had it, it was something that was very valuable. It was normally used either by the very wealthy or those that were involved in royalty in some way. Uh, we find out from the Egyptian history that myrrh was used for embalming. And if you know the interaction with the Egyptians and the Israelites, they picked up on that process. Uh, and even uh, the Canaanites used it as well. So you can understand the, the kind of the process or the, the idea that's carried along with or associated with myrrh as, we, as it moved through history. Uh, but the strange thing that I tried to wrap my mind around was, why would something that is more associated with death, why would it be given to, as a gift to a baby at the beginning of his life? That just did not make a lot of sense. Why would they give myrrh? Maybe to present that royalty, I don't know, because it was something valuable. But I believe there was a greater significance that was there. If you look in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, I think we find out why this myrrh was given. Luke chapter 2, verse 11, I read it to you at the beginning of the service. It says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Um, that verse gives us clear insight until why Christ was born. Christ was born to die. So this gift of myrrh was something that was somewhat of a prophecy or a, a foreshadowing of the ministry of Jesus Christ. He came to be our Savior. What does the word Savior mean? When we think about it in a lot of different ways, Webster defines it as someone who saves something or some, from, uh, saves something or someone from danger, harm, or even failure. So it's... Very early on, just using that simple definition, we find out what Christ came to do. If He is a Savior, He is someone who saves. Well, we're not in any danger here this morning. Not any present danger that we know of. Could something change in a moment? Sure. But why would Christ come to save us? Or what did He come to save us from? Well, Scripture implies that we've been saved from something we can't control, defeat, or overcome. There's something in our life that we needed saving from. And it's something that we can't control in our life. It's something that we can't get a hold on. It's something that we will continuously battle that we can't defeat or overcome by ourselves. So the implication is that we needed someone to come into our life that could gain control or defeat or overcome this in our life. Whatever was causing us danger or fear or 
uh, perhaps destruction in our life. We needed something else to come into our life to give us this control, to give us this victory, to allow us to defeat this danger that was in our life. What was that danger? We know from Scripture that sin is that danger. You see, sin is the precondition to salvation. Salvation is not necessary unless there's a sinner in need of being saved. I've told you this before, but one of the hardest things I, get, I have to do as a pastor is convincing people they've sinned. Most people feel that they're okay with God. That there's not a real danger in their life. They don't sense the need of being saved. But we know from Romans chapter 3, and you can turn there, we're going to look at that text in many different ways. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have missed the mark of holiness in our life. God created us to be holy. God created us in a way that we would please Him, that we would live a life that pleases Him. That's the way God created us. But when sin entered into the world through the sin of Adam and Eve, when that sin entered into the world, it marked all of us. And because of that sin, we cannot reach that level of holiness that God desires. What is the penalty for that sin? What is the power of that sin? We'll look at that later. But the point is, all of us have sinned. And let me give you the great English lesson that, English lesson that I learned in college. What does the word all mean? All. It took me 13 years to figure that out. The word all means all. All of us have sinned. Not one person who has ever been born into this world apart from Jesus Christ is not a sinner. We all have sinned. We cannot reach that level of holiness, perfection that God created. But I'm thankful this morning that God is the author of our salvation. He wants to save man from his sins. Go look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. We read that text many times in Scripture, that Christ came to save us from our sins, to deliver us from this sinful condition. Christ came to set us free, to rescue us from something that we could not control, that we could not defeat, nor could we overcome. Jesus Christ came to do that. Now think about it for a minute. The nature of this salvation, what we, God has provided for us, is through His grace. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. But by God's grace, we are saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 makes that very clear. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works. Because if it was through works, guess what? We'd boast in our salvation. We'd say, I'm better than you. I obtained my salvation before you. I'm at a higher level of salvation than you are. We would come up with some way to boast in ourselves, but we do not deserve that salvation. We cannot earn that salvation. It is by God's grace we are given that salvation. So why are we saved? What is this salvation all about? Did you turn to Romans chapter 3? Let's just read through a text just for a minute. Because I want you to understand something about this great gift that we've been given. If you look in verse 21 of chapter Romans chapter 3, we quote Romans 23 all the time. But verse 21 says this, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. This is something we knew about. The prophets had foretold this. The law had foretold this. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, until, there's that good word, all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So who can be saved? All those who believe. You see, the objects of this saving grace, this gift of God, is all of those who are repentant sinners. Let me say that again. The objects of this saving grace, this great gift, this saving act of God, is those who are repentant sinners. So what did He come to save us from? Our sin. Read the text there in verse 23. Sin is what separates from us from God. It's a rebellion against God. 
It started with Satan in the heavens. Remember that? When he rebelled against God. And that sin is still active in people's lives today. We rebel against God. Now, let me say this. I told you one of my hardest things is to get people to understand they've sinned against God, right? And they say, Brother Bart, tell me what I've done then. Tell me my sin. I often want to say, how much time do you have? But I don't do that. Listen to me, folks. The issue is not what sin do we have in our lives. The question is submission. Will I submit to what God wants for my life? That's the question. You see, at any point in time in my life when I do not submit to what God wants on any subject, on any level, at any time through my life, when I do not submit to what God wants, whether it be in action, feeling, motive, thought, it doesn't matter what it is, any time I do not submit to God in any area of my life, it is rebellion. And rebellion is sin. You see, many of us want this list of what we've done and what we haven't done, and does that make me right with God or does it not make me right with God? Folks, that's not the question. Get beyond that. It's what area of my life, what part of my life, in my decision-making process, in my values, in my motives, in my intents, what area of my life am I not submitting to what God wants? So the question is, not whether I've sinned or not, the question it is, will I submit to what God wants for my life? Back to Romans chapter 3. Verse 23 basically states that the ultimate objective is God's standard. What God wants is absolute perfection. Anything that falls short of that is sin. Now ladies, as I said before, here comes your shot. Do we know anybody that's perfect? I hate to tell you, listen, that dear man that's sitting next to you, he's not perfect. Whether you believe it or not, he's not the perfect man. I'm going to rattle your world just for a minute. You don't have the perfect child. Listen, I, I've been there, done that. I've raised three of them, got some grandchildren. There is not a perfect child. None of us reach that perfection of God's holiness. We cannot do it. We are born into sin. Let me show you what I mean. There's two different kinds of sins. Stay with me for a minute. There's the sin of omission, and there's the sins of commission. The sins of omission are those that we know what's right and we don't do them. We know what God intends for our life. We know how God wants us to live our life, but we choose not to live in that manner. That is the sins of omission. We omit doing those things. And there's the sins of commission. That's normally what we focus on. The things that we do that we know that are not right against God whether it be our language, our thoughts, our practice, whatever we want to talk about, those things that we commit. Talking, gossip, you can just go down the list. There's all kinds of things of sins, of commission. But probably where we struggle the most in our life that we don't admit it is the sins of omission. The things that we know we should do that we don't. The way that we know we should live our life. Those are where we really focus on our life. How should I have reacted? How should I have loved? How should I have cared? And I chose not to. Those sins of omission are some of our greatest sins. Now, let me show you what Christ came to save you from. Now remember, we're talking about sin. What is that sin? What did Christ, what sin did He think me? Think about it for a minute. Christ came to save us from that sinful condition or what I like to call misery. Listen. The most miserable person in the world is the person running from God. They'll never find peace in their life. That person who has the conviction of that sin on their life, and they are running from that conviction, they're running from that sin, that is the most miserable person in the world. How do you get relief? How do you get Relieve from that misery that's there. It can only come from one person, and that's Jesus Christ. 
there's some things. And you know, dear Christian, listen to me. You know what I'm talking about. When you know there's unconfessed sin in your life, you know the misery that's there. You can't sleep at night. You can't react the way you should. You get frustrated. You get aggravated. All, that thing, all those things are upon your life and you wonder why. It's because you know you have that sin and it's unconfessed. Now let's multiply that numerous times by those who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're living in misery. They're frustrated with their life. It seems like there's a dead end. There's no answers. There's no peace. There's no direction in their life. They have no answers in their life. They are in a miserable condition. Why? It's because of their sin. They're not submitting to what God wants. Let me take you a step further. I think that miserable condition leads them to guilt. I think this is one of the greatest tools of Satan. He'll make you replay those sins over and over and over and over and over again in your life. To find some kind of peace, to find some kind of hope, to find some kind of relief in your life. You'll do anything. You'll turn to things that are ungodly. That'll teach push you further into that sin. It may be addiction, it may be anger, it may be bitterness, it may be pornography. I don't know what it is, but that guilt will drive you further and further and further into that sin. And you know what it does? It not only begins then to separate you from God, but from people. Christ came to save you from that guilt. There's a lot of folks who can forgive other people, but it's hard for them to forgive themselves. They still carry that burden of guilt. Now here's the dangerous part. That when you're living in this miserable condition and you're further and further in this guilt, here's what's going to be the result of that. You're going to face the wrath of God. Remember when Jonah was running from God? He was living in that miserable state of unconfessed sin. God said, go. Jonah said, no, I'm doing it. I'm going somewhere else. Because of that unconfessed sin, he felt guilty. He knew he was guilty. The storms come. He's in trouble. He tells the other fishermen, listen, I'm the reason. I'm guilty. What does he do? He faces the wrath of God. He gets thrown over into the sea, right? Gets swallowed by the well. He's facing the penalty for his sin. Now let me say something, folks. The penalty for the wrath of God is eternal separation from God. The wages of sin is death. I'm not talking about a physical death. I'm talking about an eternal death, eternal separation from God. How am I get saved from that? How can I be saved from that eternal punishment from God? It's by Jesus Christ. Not only did He save us from the wrath of God, but He saved us from the power of sin as well. Folks, understand... Things of this world will control your life until you submit your life to God. I don't care what area it is. Financial, emotional, mental, physical. It doesn't matter to me what area of your life it is. Until you submit your life to Jesus Christ, you are living underneath the power of sin. Someone or something is going to control you. You've got to make a choice of who it is or what it is. Are you going to let Satan and the power of sin control you? Or are you going to let Jesus Christ set you free from that power of sin? I'm thankful Christ did something else. Not only did He set me free from the power of sin, but He set me free from the presence of sin as well. Look at me for a minute. Hey, listen to this. You don't have to sin. Did you know that? You don't have to live your life in sin. Now listen to me. Did I get saved the day that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit working in my life right now to set me free from the presence of sin? Yes. And one day, praise God, I will walk into the presence of Jesus Christ and I will be set free eternally from the presence of sin, never to battle it again. It's a process. It doesn't happen all at once. I'm still in the process now of being removed and, and having the presence of sin, the control of sin being removed from my life. It's still happening today through the work of the Holy Spirit. But one day, folks, listen to me, it will end. How is that possible? Through Jesus Christ. What He did when He came to earth to die for our sins. You see, sin puts us in debt to God. 
The created man owes everything to its Creator. All honor is due to God. And when we rebel against God and do not render honor that is due to God, we rob God of His own. We dishonor Him. And that's sin. Now here's the problem. I'm in debt to God, and I can't pay the debt. And God can't forgive me unless that debt's been paid. That's a horrible place to be in, amen? I owe a debt and I have nothing to pay. I have no way of paying it. The debt is too great. So how can I find forgiveness? How can I find this payment for this debt? It's through Jesus Christ. Are you still in that text in Romans chapter 3? You see, the coming of Jesus Christ provided the means to salvation. He is our Savior is what it says, right? In Romans chapter 3, verses 21, all the way through verses 25, it declares that Jesus' death brought that substitutionary satisfaction to God. Christ paid the price for my sins. Folks, listen to me. He paid the price for my sins. You know, when I was probably in the third or fourth grade, my uh, children's church leader, her name was Laura Hollingshead. She was the pastor's wife. And she taught us John 3.16, For God so loved the world, you know, you know the verse, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And as we learned to quote that verse, you know what she made us do? She made us take out the word world and put our name there. For God so loved Mark. You know, that changed everything to a nine-year-old boy. The world was something I couldn't get my mind around. I didn't know anything about the world. I was nine years old. My world was a house and a school. That's the world. Playing baseball. That was my world. That's all I could get my mind around. But when she taught us to memorize, for God so loved Mark, that He gave His only begotten Son. Changed everything in my life. Folks, I want you to understand, Christ died for you. He paid the price for your sins. You owe a debt to Him. Without Christ, the God-man, God in the flesh, paying the price for my sins, God could not be just. But He's also the justifier. You see, the just had to die for the unjust so that God's justice could be satisfied. And without that justice being appeased, God's mercy could not be released to declare us justified. We would just be sinners in His eyes and then unqualified for heaven. You see, Jesus could not have died for my sins if He was a sinner too. He would have been sinful and just had to die for his own sins. But because he was the sinless Son of God, he could die for my sins. So how did he save us? He died. Folks, I want you to understand something. There's a whole culture out there that will tell you, listen, Jesus was just a good man. He was not really the Son of God. He was a great prophet, but not really the Son of God. I want you to understand, the Son of God physically died. In the tomb, died. For your sins. He died for my sins. But aren't you thankful that's not where it ends? <laughs> We're thankful that He rose again. And he's sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for us every moment of our life. So who gets to be saved? Think about it for a minute. Oh. Go back to the text that I read to you in Romans chapter 3. For God so loved the world. We talk about it in John 3.16. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, if all have sinned, can all be saved? I don't often ask you to do this. Turn to 2 Corinthians with me just for a minute. Let me give you another text. To put in your minds this Christmas season. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is kind of like a commentary on John 3.16. So stay with me for a minute. 
And let me just say this. The best, I, 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 want, to, I want you to understand this, the best commentary on Scripture is Scripture. Did you know that? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, it says this, For the love of Christ constraineth us, it compels us. Because thus judge that if one died for all, then guess what? All are dead. Amen? And that He died for all, that they which should not henceforth live unto themselves, submitting myself to God, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. There's the gospel. Jesus died, and when I submit myself to Him, surrender my life to Him, guess what? Stay with me. Verse 16, there, Wherefore, henceforth we know that no man after the flesh, yea, through though we've known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, we know Him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself. We come back in that relationship. We are forgiven. We can come into the presence of God by Jesus Christ and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the what? The world. Hmm. Reconciling the world unto Himself. Not imputing their trespasses to Him as hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So now stay with me for a minute. So, Brother Mark, what you're telling me then is everybody's saved. Because Christ came and died for the world. Amen? That's what it says. Christ came to reconcile the world to God through His death on the cross so that all men could be saved. Brother Mark, you said all means all. So, undoubtedly, who can be saved? Everybody can be saved. Right? Mm, remember, stay with me. Go back to Romans chapter 3. Remember, got to look at Scripture. There's a whole church culture out there right now, folks, that's telling me what we call universalism, that because Christ died for all, everybody's got to be saved. Everybody who's ever walked the face of this is saved because of what Jesus did. Now stay with me. Did Christ die for all? Yes, He did. Can all be saved? Yes, they can. Stay with me. Look at verse 22 of Romans chapter 3. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all, there it is, amen, all men, everybody can be saved. Amen, Brother Mark, I'm here this morning, I'm saved. But it doesn't stop there, does it? And upon all them that what? Believe. What do they got to believe? Go back to John chapter 3. Remember, I said it's a commentary. For God so loved the world, that whosoever believeth in Him, Jesus Christ, he gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him, Jesus Christ, shall be what? Saved. So it's not just a matter of fact that Christ came and Christ came and He died for all, but only those who believe will be saved. Well, Brother Mark, I knelt that day just like you did and I believed in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. But folks, I want you to understand the word believe in Scripture means more than just a statement of faith. It means a life of faith. Isn't it interesting that Jesus' life begins with myrrh and it ends with myrrh as well? As He hung on the cross in Mark chapter 15. Who gets to be saved? Let me take you to an account in Scripture to drive this point home. You remember the disciples were in a boat. I think it's in Matthew chapter 14, somewhere in there. They're rowing across the sea. A storm comes up, right? You remember this account? Jesus is not with them at the time. He is left them to go to the other side. They're in this storm, and He says, I want you to come across to Me. They get caught up in the storm in the boat, and there's this dangerous situation. Jesus Christ, knowing what happens, <laughs> He comes walking towards His disciples on the water. Peter. Peter sees Him. 
and says, Lord, if that's you, let me come to you. He climbs out of the boat. Now, there again, these are fishermen. They know what's going on. They know the whole thing about the sea and storms and all this kind of stuff. Peter gets out of the boat, starts walking toward Christ. Right? Some script, parts of the Scripture say he took his eyes off Christ, whatever, but Peter, after walking for a while, he began to look at the storm around him. And he began to sink. Now, undoubtedly, the storm must have been pretty huge because he's a fisherman. He knows how to swim. He knows how to deal with the ocean, the sea, and all the things that go on in the sea. So this must have been some kind of outrageous storm that was going on. <clears throat> My mind is drawn to Peter as he goes underneath the water. Think about it. All of his knowledge and his talent and his abilities as a fisherman are no good. He's exhausted all of those things. He's still sinking, fixing to drown. Everything that he had done all of his life, he'd been in boats, he'd been fishing, he'd been in storms perhaps before, none of that was doing him any good. All of his knowledge was of no account. I also find it interesting, and I don't know if you noticed this or not, but none of the other 11 guys got out of the boat to help him. All of his friends, maybe even some that were closely related, none of them got out of the boat. That tells me even with a stronger urgency that they knew they could not help him. The storm was too hard. It was too deep. It, 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 it was hopeless. And as Peter looked below that water and he looked up, he had to go through his mind, there's nothing that can save me. Not my knowledge, not my wisdom, not my friends, not anything that I've ever been trained to do. Nothing can save me at this point. I'm going to die. But then he looked up and saw Jesus. And Christ reached down, pulled him out of the water. Folks, I want you to understand that's exactly where you were at in your sin, desperately lost, with no hope, no one or nothing could save you until Christ came. If you're a Christian and you're here this morning, I want you to never forget that desperation. Don't ever forget that moment. When you realize there is nothing, there is no one, I have no hope, and then Jesus called your name reached down and pulled you out. Don't ever forget that moment. It'll change the way you live your life. Did Peter make some mistakes along the way? Sure he did. He denied Christ. But we also know that Peter became the leader of the church. That Peter was the one who Christ Himself reinstated back into the ministry. Peter remembered that moment. And perhaps you're here and you're in that desperate mode. There's nothing that you know that can change your life, that can give you hope. Your friends have abandoned you. There's, <laughs> they don't have any answers. Everything that you know makes no sense. I'm here to tell you, Jesus has the answer. And He is the answer. And if you're here this morning in that moment of desperation, I'm here to tell you that Jesus 
is reaching out to you. All you've got to do is take him by the hand. Not only for one day, but for eternity. And let him change your life. Let him save you. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word, the power of it. Lord, may we never forget that day in desperation that we reached out to you and said, save me. Lord, may it change the way we live our life for eternity. And Lord, if there be anyone here today who does not know that great hope that is living in a desperate time in their life, who they are, what they know, their friends, their resources, nothing has provided that hope that relief that they need in their life. Lord, may they realize today that that is only found in Jesus Christ. 